Thank you for those nice words, and uh, thank you uh, for me to be here at USC. It's actually my old neighborhood. I lived in West Adams for a really long time, over on Raymond Avenue, Raymond and Adams. And uh, so it's, uh, it's nice to be back on campus because I haven't lived in this neighborhood for quite some time. Um, it's also interesting to be doing this coming off of a number of exhibitions as well as uh, I retired from UCLA from teaching in July. And so to dip my toe back into academia today and be in a class and so forth was really lovely. But uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I kind of wanted to figure out how to mainly talk about what the last six years of making work has meant for me instead of giving you an encyclopedic uh, kind of over story of everything because there's a lot of bodies of work and it's supposed to be an hour lecture and usually it goes over so I apologize. Um, but we're going to start out with a little bit of mirroring out just the Fiden book. Because it's very interesting in an artist's life what a major monograph does that is in a museum catalog that's not attached to a show that lives on its own out there after you've made work for 30 years. And so when the Fiden book came up, it really <clears throat> changed, <clears throat> sorry, it changed my relationship to how I even thought about my own bodies of work. And so this is just a little snippet of ideas from the Fiden catalog and just to give you a little bit about my history for those who don't know my history. I started photography when I was nine years old. This is my first self-portrait taken in Sandusky, Ohio. Um, I'm definitely a baby butch and no, I didn't know my zipper was half down. Um, <clears throat> but I feel like that in some ways this is the epitome of also the relationship to how I have focused on work throughout my life in relationship to neighborhood and community, myself, and so forth. So going from Sandusky, we go to Being and Having, which was uh, kind of my breakout body of work, I suppose, in the art world, where it's, it's I think, that the first place one of these were printed was an art form. Uh, but Being and Having was a body of work I did with my friends. And uh, we all, I, I gave them, you know, 20 bucks to go to the Hollywood uh, uh, wig store on Hollywood Boulevard and each pick out their mustaches. And uh, being and having was shot with a four by five camera. So the incredible clarity to being able to see the fakeness of the webbing was all there. And it was definitely about performing gender and what that was in relationship to 1989, 1980 when these were made. Each one has a little plaque underneath with their nicknames, which is like Papa Bear, Oh So Bad, Pig Pen, uh, I'm Bo, um, you know, Chicken, and so forth. So there are all these nicknames. And so they're, they're definitely playing on trophy, too. I mean, you definitely, with that plaque, it does play on that whole idea of trophy. Um, so after doing Being and Having, uh, with a really great LA artist that I went to Cal Arts with, Richard Hawkins. Uh, we started uh, making the original, the, the portraits together. And then he, after two portraits, he said, no, this is your body of work. Um, but I wanted to figure out, one of the, the, one of the most difficult things about photography is how do we use the language? How do we deal with the relationship to the camera as a place of documentation, but also what does it mean to begin to a, be able to like use art history as also a reference within photography that's outside of photographic references to a certain extent? So this was a question that I was asking myself a lot because coming out of CalArts, I was, with Alan Sakula as a teacher and Catherine Lord, and it was a very highly conceptualized school in some ways. And I made a whole body of work on master plan communities while I was in school. And I wanted to um, break away from the portrait of my friends in their home. And so using the bright colored seamless and Richard introducing Holbein to me began this body of work, which was uh, pretty much photographed from 1990 to 95, 96 it ends. So this is uh, the performance artist Justin Bond, Miguel. Miguel weighed about 92 pounds when I took this photograph. He lived for another week before he died of AIDS. And uh, it was really important moment in my community too to bear witness of what was happening 
the relationship to the devastation of AIDS on my community and my friends. And I promised him, he was very wary about being photographed, but I promised him that I'd make him look bigger than life. And then the images of my friends who passed of AIDS would all be at the memorial services for people to be able to take that portrait with them. Joe and Idexa. Idexa uh, appears in a lot of my work. These were around 1992. Uh, Self-portrait cutting on my back. Now, if any of you saw Harmony is Fraught, that, uh, that exhibition, which I will talk about tonight, is about the kind of relationship of infrastructure in relationship to all the bodies of work. So for the first time, you saw the home video of the cutting being made in my living room in, uh, in, in Koreatown. Um, and so it kind of, by bringing that out, it began to change like what I felt had already been the image now that's part of art history that was made 30 years ago. And what is it to kind of look around the edges of such an iconic image? Um, this is from Domestic. This is in uh, Minnesota. And this is an image which is paired in the Fiden book together. And this is what was interesting for me about the book was that it had these different moments in it where it was inauguration of Obama, but then also domestic. And then how truly all of this begins to weave throughout my life. I'm going to take off my sweater because now I'm sweating and my glasses are going to steam up. So I'm going to remove the mic here. It's very warm in here. You guys heat USC very well. You know, they, they le let us be cold at UCLA. They're like, no heat for you at UCLA. Uh, also from domestic, um, this is Harriet, Chloe, Tanya, and Flipper from San Francisco. Also from domestic, this is Miggy and Eileen, and it was uh, the day before she uh, had the twins that were in that belly of hers. The only place she was comfortable was floating in the pool. Uh, domestic was shot with an 8x10 camera. I wanted to use the specificity of that format because of the fact of what was going on with Tina Barney, with Sally Mann, with Gregory Crutes, and there was this really big movement within 810 photography and its relationship. And so using that format was specifically kind of correcting Peter Galassi's show at MoMA, which was Pleasure and Ter Terror and Domestic Comfort. And then uh, uh, Oliver was about a year old here, and this is self-portrait nursing. And so it kind of fits in with the trilogy of self-portrait cutting on my back, pervert, and then nursing, because you can still see the scar of pervert on me. And I love that I'm kind of a 40-year-old lesbian versus a Madonna and child type of image. And it just argues again with that kind of position. Oliver in a tutu. He's graduating from college this year. I can't even believe it. Um, his favorite thing to do at two and a half was the laundry. So I always had a, I, I, I always, this is in West Adams in our house. And this, we always, he was always on a chair stuffing clothes in and wearing his tutu and tiara. Uh, this is a, a image from a body of work titled 1999 in which I went on a road trip from New York to California in 1999, thinking about what was the quaint, what I call the quaint fear at that point, which is Y2K. We were all going to lose our information. So it was gonna go back to kind of almost like days of hand-painted signs and so forth. And then this is the Rendentori, which has happened every day since the plague in, in Venice, Italy. So this is, this is the, you know, the celebration of the end of the plague. Um, this is a very odd landscape that is my arguing with National Geographic. I love to fight with Nat Geo. I think it's so much fun as a photographer to poke at them all the time. So this uh, photograph is actually called Bear, uh, Bear, 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 Bears and Wolves. And, and you can't see it. And if I had a little pointer, in the meadow there, those little black figures is a pack of wolves uh, surrounding uh, two baby grizzly bears. And so, but instead you have this grand landscape. So it's like, again, that kind of arguing of what is the position of the lens of the camera? Why do we begin to look at nature this way? Nature is, does not perform that way as nature. Um, and then high school football, I traveled for 
three years around America why people wonder why I did high school football. I'll tell you. <laughs> My wife was from Louisiana, and I had to go every August there for about three weeks. And I had 25 nieces and nephews. And it's from a little town in Louisiana called Church Point. Right? You can imagine. It's Cajun country, all the way Cajun country. And I'm like a, you know, basically a San Francisco dyke that goes to the Catholic family's house and is just like, what am I going to do for three weeks? So I asked all my nephews if I could start photographing them. And then I got really attached to it as a relationship to an extension of American landscape. That so much of my work in terms of American cities and other things have really focused on, well, what is the specificity of identity? And then in making the portraits of the high school football players, I got very attached to the vulnerability of them versus the cliche of them. That so many of them at that point in time were going off to Afghanistan and Iraq in relationship to war, and that that vulnerability was on their bodies in a certain way. And I just felt like, you know, we should never go around and basically just because football players might be homophobic, there's no reason why I shouldn't uh, treat all football players with utmost respect in high school. So it's just like, it's a way to, again, be more humanistic. This is part of a body of work called In and Around Home that uh, was in companion to 1999. So there was a book, 1999 and In and Around Home, that was produced with an exhibition for the uh, Aldridge Museum. And uh, this is a blonde news reporter and a brunette news reporter. And the, this news report in West Adam was uh, a protest that was happening at this time, probably 2004, I would imagine, in which there were um, 32 registered sex offenders living in one house that the neighborhood was protesting, feeling that 32 registered sex offenders might be too much for the neighborhood. Jenny Shimutsu for a body of work titled Girlfriends. So after doing high school football, I was like, okay, that was a lot of masculinity. <laughs> Enormous amount of masculinity there. And so I decided to uh, turn to my butch friends, my iconic butch friends. And so with the body of work Girlfriends, I was kind of playing around with the title that some of them might have been girlfriends, some of them might I wish had been girlfriends. No, Jenny was never my girlfriend. It's just a wish, actually. Um, but the other thing was playing around with uh, the idea of what Richard Prince did with girlfriends, too. And so to use that language on its own, but instead of biker chicks in which what Richard Prince presented, I was presenting, like, lesbians. Iconic butch lesbians. Uh, the surfer body of work was made at, in 2001 after I made ice houses in Minnesota. They were also about this kind of notion of uh, waiting of a shared landscape, the horizon line being in the middle. They're made with an 8x10 camera as well. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I'm always trying to do with work or that I'm really interested in within photography is what do we think of what is iconic? What do we think of the cliche? How do we then interrupt it? What is a way to look at spaces and other spaces in relationship to how they actually exist as well? So we know surfers to be ripping on the waves and surfing, and that's the whole idea of a surf photograph. But what happens when it's just between the sets, like we see when we go up the PCH and they're just hovering in the landscape? And what's the relationship to the idea of temporary community? And how does that function within society and how we think about class and race and everything? So it's an extension of that kind of space in a certain way. Abstract landscapes were made during the time that I was making the portraits on black backgrounds of artist friends. And they were always meant to be a pause, but they're all of national parks. They're my poke at abstract photography because there was a lot of that going on, and I was like, what is abstract photography? Like, how do we define that? Like, what is going on with people, like, doing chemical prints and sending it through the 
processor and then that becomes abstract. What's the relationship to materiality? So I decided my abstraction would be a very well-known iconic national parks all throughout America that I would simply open the aperture and rack the lens and then that was my way of creating an abstraction. And so all of them are untitled. So you also, in the same way that you're looking at these portraits that are so crystal clear on the black background and that's using like kind of tropes and of lighting and stuff, you, you think you know where this is and you might, you know, you, you probably will shout it out to me where you think it is. But the thing is about it being untitled is that question. That relationship to abstraction as a question in terms of what you're trying to see. Yes, it is Niagara Falls. <laughs> yes, it is. But whether or not you got there, it's questionable, you know? Uh, mini malls were done in the 90s with a 7 by 17 inch banquet camera, a beautiful, beautiful camera, which is 7 by 17 inch negatives. And I started, uh, I was living in Koreatown, and this is probably one of the first ones I did actually in Koreatown. And I became really interested, I started doing the mini malls after I had done freeways. And I became really interested in the relationship of how you can tell within a city what neighborhood you've exited and entered through the facade of the mini mall. And you can understand the history of immigration within Los Angeles through the facade of the mini mall. And where you go out to, you know, you go out to the valley or you go out to Valencia, it's going to be the Jamba Juice, the Noah Bagel, the Starbucks. Where in LA, whenever you bring a collector from New York, you're pulling into a mini mall and they're like, this is where we're going to dinner. And it's like, I promise you, it's the best sushi in L.A., you know. And so there's always this push and pull about the mini malls being like the, 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 the eyesore of L.A., like the worst kind of architecture. But what they hold is so important and meaningful that I needed to document them. This is the bottom of the World Trade Towers a week before 9-11 happened. So... Timing and what becomes iconic is very odd in photography. And this has happened to me time and time again. I was making freeways, the Northridge earthquake happened. It changed the way that the work began to be looked at. Uh, when I did Wall Street, it was part of American cities, but it immediately became a memorial, the body of work. So I've always done photography in relationship to like, wow, it'll be really amazing to look at these from 100 years because of my own relationship to the archive and history. But to have these ghostly trade towers immediately disappear from the landscape was uh, really interesting to me where it made me realize the importance of bearing witness that even with my friends who died of AIDS so early on that the bearing witness aspect of photography is utterly important because things do transform so quickly more quickly than we would think. Uh, Chicago was part of American cities too the specificity of identity of that was how they light the architecture at night so each American city was wrapped around the kind of notion of specificity of identity of place, of site. This is the Four Seasons of Lake Michigan. Um, they held off the museum show for two years for me to get the lake to freeze. Uh, the lake never froze. They waited two years, and so I just had to go with one that there's a little bit of, but it should be a full frozen lake, and it still annoys me that it's not, but what can you do? Uh, I went on a container ship from the port of Busan to the port of Long Beach with Hanjin Shipping. They had a, I got a phone call. And they were like, uh, this is Hanjin Shipping. I was like, uh-huh. They're like, you've won an award. And I'm like, uh-huh. And they're like, uh, your award is that you can make a body of work on one of our container ships. You can either go from Long Beach to the Port of Busan or go from the Port of Busan to Long Beach. Would you like to accept this award? And so I accepted the award. And uh, I went on a container ship. 
and it was I decided to do the most cliche thing ever within photography which was photographing every sunrise and sunset on the journey whether or not there was a sunrise or sunset so some days it was just pure fog and then the body of work was titled 12 miles to the horizon because it's a mathematical equation to the height of the container ship to the horizon line was 12 miles, which kind of blew my mind. Um, but it's also interesting because you never really get there, just like the sunrise and sunset. Like what is time? What is the continuity of time? How do we think about it through photography? Oliver, this is a portrait that I would describe on black. This is one of the first ones of Oliver and his mouse, Mrs. Nibbles. And uh, the body of work came about after I visited London and I saw Da Vinci's show as well as Richter's show at the Tate. And Richter, for the first time, put his abstract landscapes with the portraits and that fascinated me. And that's why I started the Abstract National Parks. But then this is, I never wanted to make history portraits that were about people wearing the Elizabethan collars or anything, that they always had to be using the idea of, of painting and history portrait, but to a contemporary end. Lawrence Wiener. Also, I'm saying their last names, but to tell you the truth, like everybody it's first names. When you look at the title, everybody is first names. Another abstract. David and Thelma. Ron. Rick. Mm. Betty. Okay, now we've given you the kind of little moments of, of potential greatest hits or whatever. Now I'm going to go into, maybe they weren't even the greatest hits, I have no idea. But now we're going to go into the last uh, six years of work. How do I frame this? I frame this through the site of architecture, through the relationship of how architecture has always informed my work in really interesting ways and that as a photographer that I've always played with the relationship of what it means to photograph within genres and to make bodies of work. And so the modernist rhetorical landscapes 2020 walls, windows and blood and the last show that was at Regan Harmony is fraught is an attempt to use architecture as another relationship to uh, the metaphor of society and how we live. So in the modernist, I was made in 2017 using my good friend uh, Pigpen as the protagonist. I um, wanted to have a conversation with uh, Chris Marker's La Jete for many, many years. It's one of my favorite dystopic films about the future. And I thought that the dystopia in this moment is the questioning of utopia. So what do we do without questioning this relationship to modernism and a utopic vision? And the, uh, the idea of that as a better life, a better living with case study houses being affordable, but now they're some of the most expensive real estate you could buy in LA. Uh, so what is the relationship to the haves and have-nots of living in L.A. and how I've lived my life here in L.A.? And so I had the architect Michael Maltzen design this theater for the middle of the space at Regan Projects. And then there were vert vertical photographs that wrapped around the walls in relationship to the idea of portraiture. So using the vertical as the portrait always. Um, and then they reflect back into the surface just as modernist houses are all about this kind of series of ideas of reflections. And so the protagonist in this film, Pigpen, it's all done with black and white stills. It's, uh, it runs for the exact time of La Jetée. 
there's instead of one movement in it, there's one sound halfway through that all of a sudden unsettles you in which it's a very loud match strike as they're about ready to burn down the chemisphere house. And so um, you, you went in this theater and you saw the still images that were timed in relationship to thinking about film as well as photography. So they were not evenly timed. Um, the character throughout it is living in their studio, which happened to be my studio here in West Adams, which was a 500 square foot studio that I made all my work in from 2001 until 2017. And the collage is a collage that the character begins to build as they're burning down the houses. Now we have to remember that at this time we're in the middle of an election in which that Hillary and Trump were running against each other. We have to remember that this was before the notion of fake news even, that it didn't really, that we talked about it to a certain extent, but it wasn't part of our history. So. You know, you have these verticals of pig pen around the gallery of, of him getting ready in, in the studio. Um, the dream sequences are really important in the film. Uh, there's a number of ones in which I'm looking from outside at the studio of Pigpen sleeping on the couch because Pigpen's studio was done with perfect kind of you know, mid-century modern furniture, and then they made their art and they slept on a couch and then they had the best architecture books around them. So it was like the idea that they gave themselves everything that they could afford of how they wanted to live their lives. Um, Pigpen is just like looking at the newspaper. All the fire at the chemisphere is actually fake news that we printed on newsprint. Every time the character would get the newspaper and get excited about the house that uh, they had burned down, um, then, but it was embedded always within real news. So the real news of the day also had the fake kind of headline of another modernist house burning down. Uh, Pigpen buying a very little tr gas can, which Piggy had issue with. Later on, we buy a bigger one because Pigpen's like, I'm not carrying around that little gas can. To, you know, that, that's not butch enough for me. And so there's the bigger gas can, <laughs> much butcher. And this is a moment where the match is getting lit. And then it goes into a very chaotic scene of the spreading of gasoline. Uh, no, modernist harms, uh, no modernist houses were harmed in the making of this film. <laughs> All the fires were invented in my uh, backyard in my West Adams house. So I ended, I ended up trying to Photoshop fire and I could never get the fire right. So I just started making my own fires with fans and everything to then like put in the photographs. Uh, pig pen on the precipice, looking over the Sheets Goldstein house, more of the verticals. At one point, Pigpen had made all these little models and started burning down the models in the backyard. So this is like burning down the models. Looking at their work. This is kind of towards the end. It ends, it ends with just a match and the idea of what we don't know will happen. And originally I had written this script in the early 90s and it was gonna have a whole pseudo sexual component where Pig Pen was picked up by this woman who thought her house was gonna be next and was put in a cage to make models and then eventually burned their house down. But because the election was so bad, it ended on just a match and there was no like fantasy scene. It was just like fine as a piece as it was. And you always need to know when to pivot as an artist. It's very important. Some more flames. And then we go into rhetorical landscapes. Uh, this is an installation shot from Regan Projects. These are monitors that I bought on Amazon. They were the closest to oversized iPhones of a certain generation that I could find. 
On each one of these monitors was a stop motion political collage that I made from cutting out magazine articles for over two years. So I'm thinking about photography in relationship to how it lives on our devices. The relationship to the one day there's not going to be magazines to cut out anymore. What's going to happen to a history of political collage? How are we going to think about it? But then with it, in terms of idea of the title rhetorical landscape, I went throughout the South and I photographed swamps. So this notion of Trump would drain the swamp with these then stop motion political collages created the kind of response that I wanted in that moment. So I think we might have one that's running, I'm not sure. But here are the swamps. Swamps are really, really important things that are really important part of ecosystem that one day will disappear because of the rising water. Um, they are not to be drained, nor can they be drained. It's a totally ridiculous statement that goes back to DC being built on a swamp, which it's not really even a swamp, to be honest. Um, you'll notice an owl right in the middle of the picture looking back at you. They're very well camouflaged. Uh, how did I make them? Well, I thought that I was going to like actually go out in waders and wade in the swamps, and then the alligators are really fucking big. They're really big. They're really, really there, and there are a lot of them. They're really big. So I was like, well, I'm not wading in any swamp. That's not happening. So I just started going on swamp tours and making sure that I was the first person there at the front of the line so that I would get the front of the boat so it would look like nobody else was around me. Yeah, see? They're big. <laughs> they're very large and they're really there. <laughs> but these are also in my mind kind of bad National Geographic photographs. Like they, they rub up against that like, oh, I'm not really good enough to be a National Geographic photographer, but I'm going to try and play with you guys here. And I'm really interested in using these spaces as spaces of meditation as well. So in the same way that surfers or ice houses or even abstract landscapes, these are all places that I'm putting myself to also meditate, to begin to like think about things in a different way. They inform the quiet side of me. Um, people are like, there's one of those sides of you, Kathy? Um, and, and they're just such amazing places to spend time in. This one is one of my favorites because the, the reflection is clearer than the top of the photograph. And, but yet the water slightly moves so it almost looks like there's pixels then. And it's, it's just such an odd image. And I'm, I'm photographing all these with a hostel for, for those people with cameras out there. It's, I have a Canon 5D with me, but I also have a Hasselblad H2 with an IQ 180 back on it. So it's a, it's a big, huge, heavy camera that I'm taking out in the landscape with me. And I just did that for a 20-day road trip in Norway as I took three cameras and I went through uh, the middle part of Norway in the worst storm of the last 30 years in Norway and photo did portraits of mountains. So here's one of the collages. So you can see how the stop motion works. Each of the grids were hand painted. I wanted the grid in, uh, you know, versus kind of Bauhaus political collages that were on a grid. I wanted the grid to be broken and hand painted. I wanted the hand involved, but yet it was on a uh, um, you know, a big screen. And I don't think that I would have gotten to this without making the modernist. So it's always interesting because Pigpen was making a collage. Collage was already really a part of my mindset of what that was, do what was doing. 
but it's like I didn't want to make collages that were static. And I, I was a huge Monty Python fan as a kid. Like I, I, I just like was majorly into, you know, it's like we had a lineup on Saturdays in high school. It's like Monty Python and Saturday Night Live. And it was just like that was the lineup that you never missed with your friends. And so these have definitely a Monty Python vibe to them. Because they're supposed to be a little bit funny, but also horrifying at the same time. So it's a place where my sense of humor came into the work, where my sense of humor often doesn't come into my work uh, at all. Like my students are always really surprised that I'm funny. They're like, oh, like you're kind of funny. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so the flag comes down and then it rests. And then it, it stops for 30 seconds and then the collage starts again on the monitor. Mm. Uh-oh, we're not advancing. I might have to escape. Imagine that. Here we go. Woo, you get to see the inner workings here. Okay. Okay. One of the worst ones of them all. I think he's in jail right now. So that's a little Colin Kaepernick coming up on his knee to kneel on the red, white, and blue carpet. And the hands say, don't shoot on them that come over the door. The megaphone that never ends on our lives. That's always telling us everything. And then, of course, there was always once upon a time the newsboy who gave us the news. I don't know what's going to happen to history, you guys, in the way that we're being in the world right now. I don't know how we're ever going to get to back to a place that understands certain kind of ideas of civic responsibility and moral and ethical and those weird words that I grew up with being born in 1961. Um, I have never been so upset with the state of, of, of where we are in the world right now than at this time. Um, I like to leave, lead my life with incredible optimism, but at the same time, I have to lead with optimism that begins to be a critical lens, and that's why I keep making work like this, because without artists creating with our voices and our relationship to what we can say within our art, which we can't even maybe say in academia anymore, depending on what's going on within our schools and our structures. And so it's really, really important to use our voices in this way. Okay, I have to do the escape again. Hang on, at least I know how to do this. So you can see here the lines are kind of faded. This one is all about the rising oceans. So you have to remember with stop motion that each one of these movements is a single image that's done on, with a camera on a copy stand. This one alone took three weeks to make. That one's not over with, but it decided to stop there. 
It's supposed to get a little baby seal in the middle of the picture, you know, the whole clubbing of the baby seals. Yeah, no, it didn't happen. Okay, let's see if it'll work for now on now, now that it's not media. So 2020 Monument Monumental. The piece Monument Monumental is up right now at the Broad. Uh, so if you ever want, if you want to see it in person, it's there. Uh, 2020 um, was the, you know, the year of the pandemic. My son was going off to college to Louisiana in person to Tulane University. My wife and I were trying to figure out how the hell to get him to college and how are we going to set up his dorm room in the middle of a pandemic and we couldn't even believe that he was actually going to be in person. <laughs> and so out of the blue, I told my wife I bought an RV. I said, well, I bought an RV today. She's like, you what? And I had bought RVs before for other bodies of work, like domestic. You know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm somebody who likes an RV. I like a minivan. I like an RV. And so I thought that that was about the best way to travel around the country. And then I informed her that we were going to continue on for a month and photograph America. And that we were going to look at the monuments that remain, the monuments that got removed, the memorial sites, and we were going to go all through America and make a body of work in relationship to that, thus the Body of Work 2020, which works in all these other metaphorical ways, 2020 vision, the idea of half, all of that. So this is the piece Monument Monumental, where I use the abstract photographs that I made on the journey in relationship to the very clear photograph of the Robert E. Lee Monument, which became an incredible political activist site in Richmond, Virginia. And so a lot of these have to do with water. The falls are split. The idea of split, how we are a split country at this point. Um, you know, water as rebirth as also a very important source that we're going to need. That's going to get very political. Um, these are the individual images from uh, Monument Monumental. I think we have something very exciting coming to L.A. if it happens, which is the show that Kara and Hamza are putting together uh, for the Geffen, which is uh, bringing all of these removed monuments of what they can get together at the Geffen, which is going to be really phenomenal. So make sure that you're aware of that happening when it happens. So one of the important things about the body of work to just go back, which I want to talk about, is again, photography has such the ability to lie. It has all of this kind of relationship to the notion of truth, of what we do with it, how we look at it, how we think about it. So the, 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 the first photograph and the last photograph are taken at the exact same time. So you think that the sun is finally setting, but the sun isn't setting, it's just a repositioning of the camera because the sun hasn't set on racism in this country yet or homophobia. So it's again using this book and as a metaphor of just simply changing the camera position to work larger within the language of what you're looking at. So with 2020, I became very confused with what the single image does. And I realized that the single image couldn't stand up in the moment, that it wasn't about a single mo image, that it was about the kind of conversations that we need to be having, the dialogue. So the diptychs are in dialogue. So how I came about wanting to do it was I was joining all the BLM marches in LA and photographing them. And then this is just a map of me, like thinking about what I'm going to do to travel throughout the country. And they're all very symbolic in their movements. So the exposed roots versus roots being underneath. Also what roots did during my generation as a TV show that allowed us to understand kind of, but never really like racism and slavery in this country, it, you know. 
And then with everybody, you know, during the pandemic, still in Arkansas in these spring baths together. So this idea that a monument's not removed, but it's shrouded within the memorial from the Martin, uh, the, um, yeah, from, from Richmond, from Robert E. Lee. Um, that this woman came out for a smoke break and showed me the monument that was in the grass. Different, different states removed their monuments all the way down. Other states left the plinths and other states didn't do anything at all. And so I just love the idea that in this diptych that this, this you know, phone ends up on the top of the plinth in a certain way visually. Then I wanted to use social media. So this was when I first started watching Rich, uh, what was going on in Richmond. And this was just barely, you saw how much the monument got marked, uh, the Robert E. Lee got marked up in, in the last photographs I did. And then, you know, how can we ever forget that moment in the debate where the, where the fly was on Pence's head? I mean, that was just like one of those moments that you're just like, how can this be still on his head and how can this be happening? I've been known to take a lot of photographs off the TV. So a part of in and around home is Polaroids off the television set as well. Uh, the memorial site for Brianna. And then a family asked me to do their family portrait. And I did a lot of that every day that I was at, in uh, Richmond. Is They saw me with lots of cameras on families. And then they would ask me to do a family portrait for them. This is... Uh, George Floyd's eye from a mural painted in Portland, Oregon, and then the relationship of poverty in the South. Still counting in LA, and then a very weird uh, cocktail party I went to where somebody offered me goldfish during the pandemic with a gloved hand. <laughs> and it just, color-wise, it's just all so weird together. It's a weird mashup of like the stuff that we went through. Again, the horizon line split Confederate flag in Texas in the back of an RV. One of the most powerful memorial sites that I've ever been to in which that from each township is the names printed of who was lynched. And when you enter, they're all on the ground and as you go through it, they become raised over your head. And then this is a, a monument from, um, that still remains in New Orleans, but they spray painted on it, commissioned by Klansmen. I think bearing witness is really important. So in this, these two images, one of the things is like, there's an incredibly evasive vegetation uh, throughout the South. And so I think of the vegetation as as evasive as a continuation of racism. And then on the bottom, I went to go see uh, at Duke University in the chapel, the um, monument that they had removed to take a picture. And instead of this amazing scene was happening with this woman with her daughter, with a professional photographer being photographed in front of the chapel, um, you know, of, of graduating. Uh, yes, I watch, uh, I watch everything. I'm a C-SPAN watcher um, and all news channels. And I did watch the Republican National Convention on my iPad in my RV. And then this is, <laughs> this is the Daughters of the Confederacy. This is their, who put up most of the monuments. This, the most amazing thing that we don't know that I realized when I got to this site is next to it is the museum. And uh, Kehinde Wiley's sculpture, Rumor of War, is charging towards this building. And what really surprised me is I went back to read, you know, the reviews of that, and there wasn't one art critic who mentioned the position of this sculpture by him charging towards the Daughters of the Confederacy's, like, headquarters. Robert E. Lee High School. This is uh, from Lincoln's Boyhood Home. 
uh, the uh, relief on the outside of the museum, and then the back of uh, the Robert E. Lee. Uh, every photographer has to do the open road. It's just part of a road trip. You just do it. But then right, right by that open road photograph is the strangest little preserved monument on, in somebody's backyard on this little hump. And when I say monument, I mean Confederate monument, okay? Like, I mean that monument. This is actually from my country club that I grew up near in Poway, California that had become like just this crazy uh, white teenage like, you know, spray paint hellhole that where they were destroying it all. But then underneath it, the white picket fence with the cross on it, the porch, swamp again. And then the body of work ends always in my mind in the same way that in and around home ends with a sense of optimism. So the spider web with the idea of this huge rock that you ascend, there's these little teeny rock climbers coming up to it, but just the idea of how we get trapped. What is our relationship to it? How do we go ahead and ascend? What it, how do we get to a better humanity? Walls, Windows, and Blood is up in New York right now. If anybody's going until March 15th, it's at Lehman Maupin. Um, it's a body of work I did in 2021 at the American Academy in Rome. And the, the, I was invited for a six-week residency. And these are installation shots of it uh, from the first uh, exhibition in Naples. And the walls are very tall. Um, I don't have dimensions, sorry. But you'll notice that underneath them, they're on marble plinths. So these are the exterior walls of the Vatican Museum. So using the architecture of the Vatican to begin to talk about the hypocrisies of the Catholic Church. And so the walls don't have the right to stand anymore in my mind, even though they're really amazing historic walls. So the idea of them on marble plinths already make them about this kind of antique. All the walls in them, when you look closely at them, all have surveillance cameras. So the walls are also cameras themselves. They don't need, they, because of the surveillance cameras, what is the need for the wall these days? More of installation shots. This is a image titled No Apology. And every Sunday, the Pope comes out in his little window here, and he's in that little window right up there. He's really tiny, he's about a postage stamp size. And I wanted him to be that size because there's actual Pope stamps that you get when you go to the Vatican, because they're a city within a city. They have their own governance. And so this is titled No Apology on one of those Sunday afternoons, on, you know, and, and it was the first time ever that the Pope acknowledged the indigenous children in Canada whose bodies had just been found, which at that point were about 70 bodies. Now at this point were well over a thousand bodies. The Pope didn't apologize here, but he ended up doing an apology tour. And so this is very important in relationship to the architecture of power and how we look at it. Um, I went around the Vatican and I photographed every representation of blood within the art of the Vatican. And so I made these grids, which is my new kind of taxonomy of the relationship of kind of thinking about uh, modernism and the grid, but that it's a reordering of the Vatican Museum and the art that you walk through because it's very specifically choreographed. And so these, uh, these blood grids um, are all just, they're not cropped, they're shot full frame. So I carried three cameras with me through the Vatican and, and literally they're, you know, framed each blood uh, image like this. It's very important that they're framed and not cropped. Uh, these are the windows. I have photographed every single window in the Vatican looking out inside the Vatican Museum. And so windows mean so many things in 2021. 
especially in Italy. They are reminders of when we couldn't go outside of what the pandemic did. Windows are also about transparency. There's moments within the windows in which that the windows are open and Rome itself comes into the museum in the reflections. So what happens with that kind of joining of boundaries? Another installation shot, another blood grid. This is in an old, old apartment the, the, in, in, in Na Napoli. This is kind of a self-portrait. You'll see myself in the reflection with my arm up. I also did that in uh, 700 Neems Road with uh, Elizabeth Taylor. I have my reflection in the Warhol. My favorite Amazon book review was somebody was like, you know, I hear Kathy Opie's a really good photographer, but why couldn't she photograph that Warhol without her reflection in it? It's <laughs> like, yeah. Be intentional, my friends. Be intentional. Uh, just moving you through the show. Another blood grid. There's four blood grids, 20 windows, and 14 walls in the entire body of work. I try to always do every installation in relationship to a site and the architecture of the site. So this was had, you know, it was a home, so it really changed it, where if you see it in New York now up, it's a totally different show, and it's so weird how it, it is really completely different. Uh, this was a beautiful gallery to be in. Here's some examples of the windows, I mean of the walls. You can see the cameras up in each one of them. These were shot, just for those photographers out there, these are shot with a Hasselblad X-Pan. So this is actually 35 millimeter black and white film, and it's a panoramic camera. And instead of doing what I did in American cities, which is always panorama as a horizontal, I got really excited about the verticality of it. And when you see the prints, they're so pretty because of the grain. You know, I geek out on stuff like that. I'm a very material photographer. But it's been interesting to try to figure out the, this is an image of the plinths. The marble was made in Italy as well, and I wanted it to be veiny kind of of the body, like very much what you found in the art. So this is a moment where Rome reflects back into the museum. And these are like the really, like, I love when all of a sudden the city comes in. But to work with the structure of what is transparent, what is not transparent, like the idea that some have shades down, I would basically go every day, buy a ticket, and I would proceed to photograph in the space. And because it was the pandemic and they hadn't really allowed tourists back in, I had a very unusual experience at the Vatican and I had never been to Rome. It was my first time in Rome. And so I didn't know that the Vatican, and usually you're walking through it like this, looking at everything. I had no idea. But I was completely free. I, was, I could lie on the floor in the Sistine Chapel and like for three hours and look up at it and just be on the floor and nobody else would come in. And so uh, there was a lot of rumors going around out there and I'm, I'm here to like tell you, no, I did not have special access. No, the Vatican didn't empty out the Vatican for me. I just bought a ticket, just like buying a ticket to get on a boat to go out to swamps, you know? Sometimes you just buy a ticket. <laughs> this one I love for its weird moments about photography. Like to me, this is like this geeky one where the radiator looks like old film clips. Like I just get in the, the what happens with the shadow and stuff within it. This gives you a little bit clearer view of it than the installation shots. 
Um, I really appreciate how thinking about the painters, when they would get to the blood, it would be their abstract moment within the painting. And I really started getting into that and thinking about what that meant also metaphorically for them to have to tell this story, like what it is to tell the, the kind of biblical stories, but then all of a sudden you get like all of a sudden this moment where your brush can just be like about the blood. Whoops, sorry, I'll leave you with that one for a bit. Um, they're not, as I said, they're not ordered in relationship to going through the rooms, uh, but Heather, my amazing assistant, did identify every single work of art that these images came out of, so we do have a map of that. One of the things that I've found very interesting, I've been doing a lot of interviews about this work since I made it because it's been, it just went from back to back shows. And one of the things that's so interesting that everybody wants to talk about in every interview is, well, did you do this because of your relationship to your self portraits because of your own blood and your own body? And I said, well, there's a part of that, yes, but also there's a huge part of this that you can walk through a place like the Vatican that has no trigger warning labels on any of this, and it's some of the most fucking horrific shit you could uh, be exposed to, and yet I get trigger warnings on my work, which is like two stick figure girls holding hands. Like, it doesn't, you know, the, again, it's about the hypocrisy. It's about the relationship and the hypocrisy of whose bodies get to be where and what bodies get to be celebrated. This one is the only one in which there's a moment of narration within it. And that is, in the actual tapestry, this blade comes down into this child's head within the narrative. And that's the only moment within the grids that I allow a continuity of narrative to, to begin to happen. Harmony is fraught. How many were able to see the show just out of curiosity? Okay, so a few, but at least it'll be new to some. So this is a show that just came down on Sunday, and it was a very, very hard show for me to make. Um, I wanted uh, to give Sean Regan, who I've been with for 30 years as a gallerist, who started showing me in 1993, I wanted to give her an anniversary show. And we knew that it was gonna be up and freeze. And through everything that you've seen in relationship to idea of structure, I've been wanting to make a body of work around the archive and what the archive actually means to me after making work. But I didn't want it to be the best from the archive. I didn't want it to be like a museum show. I needed it to be a brand new body of work of never before seen images. So you entered in the gallery. On the outside wall is a huge vinyl piece of the Palms, which was at one point the only seven day a week lesbian bar in LA on Santa Monica Boulevard and, and West Hollywood. And then on that is, on the, on the architecture of the vinyl is a series of club photographs from Club Fuck and other things that we'll get to. And then how the installation works is, is that you're greeted with a line of portraits of this line of portraits and they're all outtakes of different shoots that I was doing so I always had my Hasselblad loaded but I never wanted to show any of my two and a quarter work because it was always too close and you have to think that the, these started in 1982, 1983 some of these images they were always too close to Hujar and Maplethorpe and David Armstrong and I wanted to create a different language around my community but, you know, there's amazing outtakes in this because there's moments where I do an ad for the gauntlet and it's all the gauntlet staff naked or there's these different kind of crazy moments in it. Then when you enter, you come into first a freeway. So this is from the 105 and both freeway and bridge are under construction. They're not completed, they're not finished, and under construction is a really important term to how I think we all are as, as in the relationship to harmony as fraught too, that we're always a work in progress, that we haven't been able to achieve any kind of utopia. 
Uh, maybe some of you have. Please tell me the secret to it. Um, the freeways, when I made them, were originally platinum prints and very small. But I made them while I was the lab tech at UC Irvine. And so I was driving down five days a week to Irvine, and I built it, all the dark rooms there and designed them. And then I was the lab manager. And so I, was, I had just put it in a beautiful mural enlarger that I was going to make large freeways with. And I realized that, that they, it was too obvious, that they became too monumental. But then I could go back to it because it's something that I always wanted to see. So the perimeter of the exhibition is all landscapes within LA that deal with the idea of LA in relationship to infrastructure. Then the inner components, which was two kind of X's, began to be the constellations of almost diaristic photographs from my personal life. So in it, you have Tony Green's studio the day after Tony died of AIDS, Judy Bamber, Richard Hawkins in our loft. And I'm just going to go through these installation shots because I think most likely we have the individual photographs in this too which I can point out some things. So Beverly Hills House, but it was never part of the Beverly Hill House series. So they're all outtakes. It's very important about that. There were 60 images in the show. The back wall began to be the, the thesis of the show. So it's the idea of the queer body, Raven's body on the precipice to the Sixth Street Bridge getting built, the relationship to that as an infrastructure, but also that that bridge was always the connecting notion of East LA to downtown, like what it represented also through film and everything. And then you have uh, an, a 1988 photograph of a protest down at City Hall, which was uh, anti-gay legislation law titled AB 101 in which it was going to be able to, you voted to be, gay, be able to discriminate, discriminate against gays and lesbians in the workforce. Um, it did not pass, but it almost passed. And we have had over 200 laws right now throughout the United States in terms of anti-gay. Uh, on an old Trinitron monitor is the home video of self-portrait cutting being done. All my work up to that point was done in my living room in Koreatown, um, which is like a small living room. I made all the portraits, all being and having, everything was made there. Um, so it's really kind of, again, you see the, the kind of domestic side of what it was as being an artist. You don't need a big studio, but it's really helpful. Like now I have a big studio and I'm never going back. <laughs> So more installation shots. Here's an installation shot of the vinyl. The important part of the placement was that from the windows from the outside, you could see the palms neon lit. And then from the lower windows, you could see the uh, club photographs. And here's a shot of the club photographs. This is a shot from outside. And then we just go into a line. Marussia, Harry and Stanya, Pigpen, the gang. So when I did Being and Having, you'll notice all of them from Being and Having, but afterwards I just did group photographs of them with my Hasselblad because it was already loaded, but it wasn't the intention of the body of work. Mike and Sky cruising each other. The Gauntlet gang and a great performance artist in LA in the 90s, Trash. Then you have the freeway. Sixth Street Bridge under construction. This is from the uprising, not Black Lives Matters, but from the uprising in relationship to Rodney King. And this was my taco shop in, in uh, Koreatown that got boarded up and the National Guard patrolled our neighborhood for two weeks. This is uh, really interesting. This is, a, I lived in MacArthur Park, and if you look at that blue house, all the way in the background, there's this old Victorian house right there. And that was my house. And so that's why I started photographing uh, the building of the, the red line uh, subway, was because it was being drilled underneath my house. 
And but that how the picture was chosen not only in terms of infrastructure again, but because of that house, and you'll come to an image of a woman on a bed with the three windows, and that's the three windows from the inside, um, where this one you see the three windows from the outside. So the whole thing pinned on this inside-outside relationship, private, public, all of that. Uh, one of the houses. And then my idea when I was making the houses, I was always making domestic too, but this is of Catherine Lord and Millie Wilson, who were my two really important professors at CalArts, and they had been together for quite a long time, and they had broken up uh, right after this photograph. And then two other pr friends of mine, Connie Samaras and Alice Eccles, who had been together for 13 years, I did their photograph, and then they broke up right after I photographed them. So then all my friends were like, no, 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 you're not going to photograph us for domestic. This is a Kiss of Death series. And I was shooting with an 8x10 camera, and I, I did these in 1994, 95, and then I put the body of work away because I was like, fuck, is it the kiss of death? Am I like screwing all my friends' relationships out of me trying to seek my own perfect domesticity? And uh, then I bought an RV and then I traveled the country and it became a better body of work. This is a landscape from the interior, interior of Club Fuck, which is a great silver like club. Uh, this was photographed for On Our Backs magazine. It was a, it was a, a whole erotica uh, issue, and I, I called this shoot Hollywood, I think. And then Michael's Bridge, or The Bridge. Michael Malson, who's the architect who designed the theater for the modernist, also designed The Bridge, so I have a very close relationship with him about L.A. And then this is the pro, and what I love, was so interesting is like what the cops look like in the 80s, right? I mean, don't they look like 80 cops? And then, then you think about the cops now and there's no way, like were the cops just sitting there while well, they're just some like lesbians and gay men, what are they gonna really do to us? Like I keep thinking like we broke the glass, we were holding the door open, like we were really being activists and they're just kind of just standing there not even really thinking about us. Uh, just some excerpts from the cutting. This was last year when the snow came all the way down. And looking out over Frogtown and the LA River. This is, uh, I'm on my roof at, on Catalina Street, which we called Casa de Estrogen. And, uh, and the neighborhood started burning down during the uprising. And one of the, uh, my good friends, a great photographer, Anthony Lepore, came to see the body of work before I put it out. And he was just like, you know what's really interesting is like how you're talking about photography with this body of work more than I've ever seen when it, with any other body of work. And I would agree with him on that. That he said, like, for instance, this could very easily be a Jeff Wall setup in a certain way, but that you're all, you're finding this in the city and you're making these in real time. You're not staging, which would have been the very popular thing to do at that point in the 90s in relationship to making images. This is Langer's Deli, MacArthur Park. I love these figures using the phone. You could tell exactly that it's like 1988, 89 with the cars. Even, even when you look at the print, the sky is never that like smoggy and pink anymore. And then a surfer surfing, and one that's a horizontal. This happened here at USC, many of you might remember. This was quite recent. Um, this is the frat house in terms of the protests that happened in relationship to the, the women who were raped. This is the day before the verdict of the O.J. Simpson trial. This is also shot 8 by 10. This is Silver Lake. This is this many gang members died within a 10-day period of time. And then also the relationship to thinking about graffiti and Lawrence Wiener and the fact that you have this kind of Lawrence Wiener text placed within the city in the 80s was just fascinating to me of how art is used, to how we think about it. And then the constellations. So here we have Tony's studio the day after he died. Judy Bamber, 
she did the cutting of uh, self-portrait cutting on my back and she was a painter, is still a painter, very good friend of mine. This is the three windows from the Victorian house of Pam. This is called Sunday Morning Sex. Idexa and then Pam. And again, you see flavors of Nan Golden or Wolfgang or Jack Pearson or there's all of these dialogues about what the camera did that I tried to stay away from within my bodies of work and I've just decided like it was okay to reveal the geeky photographer side of me. Angela and El, Ellie. Ellie was a car mechanic, came home from work that shot 8x10. I was still learning the 810 camera then. This is titled Fake Sleeping, so I didn't have a lover. And I was just like, fuck, there's no lover to photograph me like Nan does of lovers or anything. So I'm just going to set my camera up and pretend I'm my own lover photographing myself. So this is titled Fake Sleeping. And then these were kids that I played with in the neighborhood all the time at this time at MacArthur Park. This is the gay rodeo in the 80s, and then Bill Jones. That was taken as an editorial photograph for the LA Weekly. Sarah Shulman, Hollywood again. Lindsay and her dog, Miss B. You can barely see the dog in there, but it's in there. This is from Girlfriends. It's an outtake from Girlfriends. Uh, Matthias, one of my uh, friends and teachers from CalArts and the great queer filmmaker who also taught at CalArts when I was there, John Grayson. We have Ian. I think the movie was sold out that night, so she was like, well, let's go to the, the studio and just do some play piercing and like mess around, and so we did. This is actually, you'll notice the borders on this negative. This is a type 55 negative that Polaroid made, which was a positive and a negative film, and this is Christian. And then uh, Jenny, this is titled Gay Pride. This is titled Yes, Ma'am. And then it's Kashila's 45th birthday invitation that I made for her. And again, the infrastructure show, the, the, the seamless stands are in it. The mail is coming through the mail slot of the apartment. Divinity and Pigpen. Miss Velma, uh, advertisement I made for a Ron Athey uh, performance. Uh, it's my best friend Idexa with her newborn the day before I had Oliver. They came down to visit to, because she wanted to see me all pregnant. Then we have a contact sheet of self-portrait cutting. And then we have Oliver with the holiday turkey. Me at 28. Self-portrait medicine cabinet. You have Bo's mustache up on top with my cock. And then obviously I'm insecure about my own mustache, so I'm apparently bleaching it. And then, you know, of course there's other things in there too. The palms. And then the club pictures. So many of these people are no longer with us. So it's also really a site of a memorial for me. And that's it. Thank you.